And I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to the book that we're reading as a church community. We're going to look in the book of 2 Corinthians uh, this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And as I have on the title, which kind of goes a bit with Jessica's testimony, Affliction and Thanksgiving and how they go together. Through all of them, we are called and we have the privilege and the joy of bringing glory to God. It's a delight to be able to do that. And we want to, I want to show you how those things align and how they work themselves out in the Christian life as you are seated here today, seated here today, actually bringing glory to God by your very presence, worshiping in the body together. You are bringing the thanksgivings and the glories to God. You are honoring God with your life by speaking truth to your own hearts and to each other. And this is great. The Apostle Paul uh, is the apostle to the Gentiles that God has called. He's, he's written one letter we know, 1 Corinthians, to a community that's been hurt and broken between themselves. And there's all different things that he's worked to repair. But in the meantime, between the two letters, as he writes his second letter right now, uh, there's two things that are happening and are on Paul's mind. When we get to chapter 4, he's been working through this, this argument. And here, here are the two things. The, the, the first one is that there was a, a guy, some, some person or persons group, uh, that had come into the Corinthian church and was starting to undermine Paul's authority and to question whether he was a true apostle or not. Okay? And if you could do that, if you could question his calling and question his authority, then you could easily question his message. And that's what they did. They started to undermine Paul's message, which was the gospel. Now, that very message that Paul had shared had actually um, transformed and changed the lives of the Corinthian people. They had become believers through the gospel message that Paul had delivered to them. This, Paul knew, look, if you undermine that message... We are going to have a gospel movement in Corinth. The gospel will stop going out because it's going to be polluted. It's going to be contaminated. It's undermined, and it's not true. And so this was a big concern. So he really comes back, and he starts to open the windows and show in new light, this is the gospel that has saved you. Don't listen to someone who questions my authority and then my calling and my and, and then my message to you because that message was received by you from the Lord. And that's, that's very dangerous for you. You're in a very dangerous situation spiritually and in all of life. So then number two, consequentially, the second thing is because they were listening to a person or persons that came from Israel uh, that were adding the law into the gospel of grace and suffocating grace, the Apostle Paul felt and knew that the people whom he had shown Jesus, whom he had um, become a loving spiritual father for, if I could say it that way, a, a, a brother, he is sacrificing his life for them. He, he, his number one mission as an apostle is so that he can proclaim Christ and let people be transformed by Christ. And here were these precious Corinthians whom he had loved into the faith and they were distancing themselves from Paul because of that false message. And it was causing them to, to uh, turn from their affection away from the Apostle Paul. They were losing their, if they will, their affection for the grace that God had sent through Paul to them. Paul's ministry, he viewed it as God is giving grace to me totally transform my life on the road to Damascus. And with that same grace, I'm bringing it to you. And it's a cascade. It's a river flowing through me out to you. And because of that grace, it will turn your lives over. And that will draw us together because we're in the same body. But yet they're distancing because of these other messages that were coming in. And Paul writes a, a series of arguments because that's what Paul was. Paul was a, he was a master attorney. He was very well educated, and he is writing a series of arguments, but a proclamations of what the gospel is and his affection and truth for them so that they will not fall away or their church won't be broken. Corinth is a major city in that ancient world. 
And if the gospel stops there, he knows basically all of southern and central Greece uh, is going to be impacted by that. So the Apostle Paul comes in and he writes, and we're getting down toward, before he goes to another section, in these verses that we're going to look at today, we're getting down toward the end of the argument, which he says, if you follow this line in this chain, it will produce thanksgiving in your life, which will also produce glory to God, okay, through your life. But Paul shows that it, thanksgiving doesn't come until affliction and trials have worked themselves out and our hearts have been aligned to the story of God. And so I want you to look with me in verse 13 of chapter 4. He says, since we have, or if we can say it this way, because we have the same spirit of faith. And I'm going to keep, we'll keep that verse up on the screen, but the word since is also because it is causal. Having something together means something will happen next. It will drive us to a similar approach in Christ, okay? That's what he's saying when he uses the word have. Now, this word is a participle, okay? And a participle, as you might remember from school, is something that ends in ing. It is a having. It is the word idea of sharing. This is not the first time he mentions a having, that something that they have together. So I want you to see a few other times just to get the context. What is Paul saying? Here he says, we have, we share together, we have been given, and we are having the spirit of faith. The spirit of faith. Uh, let me give you a note on this. I, it, in, in studying and looking at this, I don't think that they were correct in keeping it a small s on the word spirit. If yours has a small s, I believe it should be a capital S because all of the arguments up to this point, Paul is saying, start with and, and come from the Holy Spirit of God. This is a spiritual activity. You say, well, what's the difference? Whether spirit of faith or capital S spirit of, of faith or the spirit of faith, the difference is this. If you come in and you say, well, I have a spirit of faith, that's more of an attitude. And that's more of an acknowledgement, like, I feel like, yeah, faith is, is growing in me. I, I feel like I like Jesus and the stories. I, I feel faith. It's an attitude toward it. The difference is it's not an attitude. It is a person of the Godhead who reveals. Because for Paul, spirit and faith are inseparable. They go together. In other words, what is faith? Faith is trust in the revelation and the message of Christ himself and you can't do that unless the Holy Spirit reveals that to you and gives himself to you, his own revelation to you. You can't do it. You can't trust. God has to give you that gift of faith. So if you have the gift of faith, you also have the gift of the Spirit who's revealing the message of the center of humanity, the one meaningful message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for you. You see? And you can't have it apart. That's why it's the Spirit of God who is the Spirit of faith. This is something precious. Friends, you didn't have this before the Holy Spirit came in your heart, this, this faith. We, didn't just, we weren't just born with this faith, this feeling of faith. See, there's a difference. The person of God must come in and change us, must save us, must forgive us. So I believe that he's talking about the Spirit of faith, because it's going to be the same spirit, the Holy Spirit, that connects us with the next phrase of an ancient biblical prophet and writer. And we'll get to that in a second. But what I want to do is go back to some of the haves that Paul is saying. So in this case, he says, we have the Holy Spirit who moves us to have faith and trust in the message and in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay? That's what we have for this passage. Just drop back a few verses to verse 7. What do we have there? We are having together this treasure. What treasure? The gospel of Christ, but we have it in jars of clay. That's not a band, that's, in, that's a metaphor. All right? So we have it in jars of clay, and that's a, what is the treasure? In other words, if you look at it, here we have as... Uh, people who have struggled through life, the spirit of faith, the Holy Spirit of God living in us, verse 7, 
Here we have as people who are getting older and falling apart <laughs> and, uh, and who uh, may suffer trials, persecution, sicknesses, you name it. And that is on the outside, the flesh, the body is showing its wear and decaying. On the inside, there is a powerful treasure of truth. There's something more beautiful always on the inside and more powerful on the inside for Christians than what's on the outside. Okay, and this is what Paul wants to get to. This is why they, this is why they shouldn't become distant with, from their apostle and from his message. Uh, just top back with me. Uh, let's go back again. Um, there's another one. Oh yeah, verse one of chapter four. Verse one of chapter four. It says, "Having therefore we are having what this ministry from the mercy of God, we have courage together. We don't lose heart." We're confident because we know where the story ends and how, where it's going. We understand this. It's a ministry. Therefore, we have a precious sacrifice of God to live out. Uh, go back to chapter 3, verse 12, just up the page in your Bibles. Verse 12. Here we have, our sharing a have, another one of his arguments. We are having such a hope. And our hope is so strong that we can literally speak like Moses spoke. Before God, to God, and before the children of Israel. So we're, we have a hope that is certain. You see what I'm saying? On the outside, trials and tribulations and struggles. On the inside, hope, ministry, uh, truth, treasure, and also here, the Holy Spirit who brings us faith and revelation of Jesus Christ. We, we have a call and a place in the kingdom of God that outside the outside world just cannot understand. And you didn't understand until God came in and united us all into one family. Paul says it's all in plural and it's all together and it's all possessive. We all together are sharing in what God is dropping on the table. We're picking it up, okay? He's putting it down. We're picking it up because he's doing this for his church. Now, Go back to verse 7, if you have your Bibles open there, of chapter 4. There he says we have a treasure, and then he talks about his jar of clay. In 2 Corinthians, we learn all kinds of things about the personal life of Paul. He starts talking about, yeah, afflictions are coming. And if I didn't have Christ, and I didn't have this treasure, then these afflictions, oh, let me tell you, they would just destroy my life, and I would have to make up my own destiny. Really, I'd be lost. Look, look at what he says here. Uh, verse 8, we are afflicted, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, not forsaken. We're struck down, we're not destroyed. In other words, yes, we are living our lives out by the call of God. It's not always roses. It's not Disneyland here that we're, that we're living. I'm telling you, there are afflictions, but there's not total destruction. We're not completely lost. Why? Because inside, inside our hearts, the gospel thrives. And therefore, he says, death is working. Death usually doesn't do anything. Death is death, right? But death, he says, actually has animated and it has a power. It's working itself out on us as we are persecuted, as we are afflicted and perplexed and all these different things that he mentioned. But... For your sake, the gospel of grace is showing transformed people all over Asia Minor where we're preaching and yourselves too. The same gospel and the same spirit is working itself out in Corinth. The gospel movement has started in Christ. You see, the apostle Paul realized that all of the world and all of life had changed and reversed at the very moment when Jesus exited that tomb. And therefore, when Jesus came out and he resurrected from the dead, everything was now different. And he is saying, now the Holy Spirit of God is working those truths down in my heart because the afflictions get so bad sometimes that I think we're losing it all. But we're not. I think I'm being completely crushed to death, but we're not. I think I'm being totally confused in life, but I'm not. Why? God's working that truth from the inside out 
this grace that's coming to you. Now we can explore our verse here on the screen a little bit more. The same spirit of faith that's doing all of that, that taught us all of that, that united us together into, into God and into his word, that same spirit um, was the spirit that spoke to the prophet who is quoted here next. Same spirit according to what has been written and he quotes from the prophet King David. Did you know King David was a prophet? And David wrote about this and he said, I believed and so I spoke. What is he talking about? This is a quote from David during a time of his life when he had a lot of afflictions where there was trials and troubles and circumstances around in the kingdom, but also physical sickness. Uh, what, a couple of the commentators that I was reading about this, they were talking about how, how David was having almost a dual battle. He had these problems in his, in his kingship and, uh, and, and, and also trying to follow God with all of his heart, but then there were people, um, but then he also had the sickness that he felt he was just gonna die. Have you ever had that? <laughs> that you're like, open the gates to heaven because I'm coming. It's just so, such a bad sickness. I've had COVID, but I've had worse. I don't know about you. Uh, I remember some years ago when our kids were little. And uh, since Riley, my son, is not here, I can just blame it on him. It's easy that way. And that is, he went to a Zillo, you know, the Italian elementary school, uh, preschool stuff. And he picked up, uh, I think, COVID-9, because this is years ago. And so he picked up the first ones. Obviously, there, there, it was a flu that was, it was monstrous. And, and never before and never after have we as an entire family been sick all together for so long. It demolished us. And I just remember, like, how much longer can we go being sick like this? And it was, we had so much fever. It was everything. And I'm not going to go into the details. You just start filling in the blanks. What's your worst sickness? And that's what we had. But we were sharing it together. And, you know, every day we, that we were waking up and seeing each other, we were just thanking each other. It's been a good marriage so far up until this point. If I don't see you tomorrow, you know, we're thanking God for it. And, and we had people, we had deacons in our church. And uh, one of the deacons and his wife brought like this really nice soup and pasta and stuff over. And they came and they knocked on the door. And we were late. We, were, we had a couch and the door's right there. And we were laying right there. And, um, and they said, oh, we just want to see you. We want to pray for you. We want to give you this. And we're like, No. You can't come in. And they're like, no, you're kidding. We're like, yes, you cannot come in here. Just leave it at the door. We love you, but we don't want to see you. And there is, and the reason is because I was like, there is a good side and a nice looking side to me, to Rob, but this is not one of those times. This is really hideous. And so we, we just, uh, they were kind of shocked that we didn't even open the door. They're like, we want to pray for you. And we're like, pray through the door. The Lord hears it. He knows. You can cover us. Pray from down the street. But we're, we're dying here. I remember a few years ago, I was suffering from gout. Your predecessor was helping me with that. I, I have gout attacks. If you guys don't know what gout is, it's just a really old man's disease. And... Uh, <laughs> Some of you know, some of your family members have had it. It's really broad, and I, I had one, an attack, and uh, it was one of my most severe attacks, and, and it had swollen up my leg and my knee, and my knee was between cantaloupe to watermelon size, and, that's, and it was just so filled and inflamed. And, and gout will come on as, as an attack no matter what position you take, whatever, it just attacks, and it's, it feels like... Basically, one night, Sandy wasn't there uh, because I think she was giving me a lot of space. I was turning a lot and a lot of pain and stuff so that she could go rest. And so I, I was laying there by myself. I could not move. There was an attack. And it just felt like basically a truck was running back and forth over the top of my leg. And then later, it felt like a vice grip was crushing my leg. And then somebody was just turning it all, ever so slowly, constantly. That's what it feels like. And it got so bad that I was having a hard time breathing because I was just under, you know, so much pain, you know. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to pass out. But what I said was, I'm going to die. I said, this is it. This is my last words. God, I'm coming. And they're going to ask, how did he go? He went from his leg, killed by his own leg, you know, that kind of thing. I knew it was going to happen. Uh, and uh, have you ever been there? Like, it's, you're just so absolutely sick. You think that's it? David actually was there and Paul was too. 
And David from persecution, but also from sickness and illness. Paul from persecution and being beat up, left for dead, all of those things, uh, and tortured repeatedly because of what he believed. David comes in Psalm 116. Would you turn back to 116? We'll take a quick look at those verses before we proceed and come back to our passage here. Psalm 116. Well, this one, I'm, I'm showing you the, the chain of how we get to Thanksgiving, okay? Um, the first nine verses of chapter 116 or Psalm 116 is talking about what David was going through in his afflictions and what he believed. So you get to like verse, look at verse three. Uh, the snares of death encompassed me the pangs of Sheol laid hold upon me. That means like death. I was so close, it was gripping me and pulling me down. But then verse 4, I called on the name of the Lord. O Lord, I pray, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord, he says in verse 5, and righteous, and he's merciful. The Lord preserves the simple. When I was brought so low, when all the afflictions were on me and the trial and my test, I was so low, God saved me. So, soul, I can preach to you. Return to your rest because the Lord is the one who's dealt bountifully with you. These are the things that he believed. He delivered my soul. Now jump to verse 10. He said, that's what I believed, but verse 10 says, I believed even when I was speaking these words out loud, what words was he speaking? I am greatly afflicted. Even in my pain and under my troubles and my trials, I still knew that God was covering me, that he wouldn't let me be destroyed. How did he know that? Because the Holy Spirit of God was telling him, I have a reason for your sufferings. How could David, when he is in the worst time of his life, still say, God, I'm greatly afflicted, but I know that you still love me? How does he know that? Because, you see, friends, he knew his God before his afflictions arrived. One way that you're going to get good thanksgiving into your families and at this thanksgiving is really thinking about the character and the person of God. Know your God before you get to the afflictions that will tempt you to forget all about him and lead you into desperate despair and isolation and misery. Okay? Know your God. And this is encouragement. I believed, this is what I believe those first nine. Now, even when I spoke, and he starts, even when I am greatly afflicted. Now, David, in the rest of the verses, continues with what he spoke. He did a sacrifice of thanksgiving. These were the actions of his belief. God is here. God is not going to abandon me. I came close to death. Life has been miserable. But yet, here's what I'm going to do because I believe God is above all of this. And he's got me in his hand. So he goes. He does a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. He pays his vows in the congregation. He preaches and proclaims the greatness of God before the people as king. But Paul doesn't go in all that. Paul stops with this verse. We get back to 2 Corinthians 4. And so we jump back over there. 2 Corinthians 4, where we are, Paul says, Okay, I am in line. If I have the spirit of truth, I am in line with David, the king and prophet. And if you have the spirit of truth, you are in line with him too. He knew that God would provide a savior. He was looking forward to it. The savior has come, and now I pick up and say, I am greatly afflicted, but I do it because it is for the glory or the revealing of the savior in my life. That's where Paul does. He anchors it to it. Kids, young people, do you guys know that the same Spirit of God, when you receive him, connects you to be a family member with King David himself in the Old Testament? That's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying what David believed in because the Spirit was in him is what I believed in and I'm proclaiming is Jesus Christ himself. 
He anchors the Old Testament with the New Testament together. Why is that so important? Because if you become a Christ follower, a Christian, then you will go through afflictions that will bring you to the image of the Son of Jesus Christ. But it doesn't mean, watch this, it doesn't mean that your afflictions have the last word. It doesn't mean if you have the Holy Spirit on the inside that your trials, your troubles, and your afflictions on the outside define who you are. And Paul is calling to the Corinthians and saying, hey, we are sacrificing our lives for the gospel of Christ because it's so precious to us on the inside. And you, we know you also have afflictions too. But what is God doing? He has a reason for it. There is meaning to this. He is bringing you into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So in verse 13, we are lining up with the ancestors who were pointing to Jesus, whom when the Holy Spirit comes in, by faith, he reveals Jesus to us. And that's how we too, when we come under affliction and trials, we can say, we know this is temporary, and we know this is hard, but God, you have not forgotten us. We are not destroyed. We might be down, but we are not destroyed. God is there. Now see, what happens is, when we preach that to ourselves, and we don't start preaching lament and complaints and all these other things, the world cannot say the same thing. They have nowhere to turn. When afflictions come, what do others in the world do? They turn to complaining or gossiping or destroying or judging or hating. But that's not what we have. Why? Because we have this Holy Spirit of faith who's in us. And when we're aligned to the Holy Spirit of faith and allowing him to preach to that little inner voice that talks to us so much in, our, in the back of our minds, then when we listen to the Holy Spirit, our hearts calm down, they steady, but then they also start to become adorative or worshipful. We start to give thanks. And I'll show you that here in the next verse, next two verses. So verse 15, 14. Here's, the, here's the underlying, another underlying motive. Knowing, knowing what? This is what the spirit of faith is telling us. This is the faith. This is why we speak while we're under affliction. We believe what we speak. And so when, let me, let me, let me back up. When God showed us what it meant to be a child and to be saved, like for Paul on the road to Damascus, Paul said, I completely believed. And because that story is so real and the gospel is the central story for humanity, then that is why I speak. And because I speak, people are being changed. And also, I'm suffering for it. And suffering is an evidence that I am speaking the truth of the Holy Spirit who binds us together. Your afflictions might simply be because you are regularly seeking to speak the gospel truth into your lives and families. You may be even afflicted at times spiritually just because you're here singing truths to your heart and to one another about God. Listening to God's word, bringing your family along, training them, seeking help, um, mothering them, fathering them, uh, parenting them well, parenting their hearts, correcting them. All of these things in your life, working with your spouse, seeking to reduce the fighting and the anger. Yes, the competition and the struggle. What? All of those things, you're, you're going through affliction, submitting to the Holy Spirit of God who's working his truth. What is he working in you? Life. Life over death. The breaking way of the resurrection. Look at verse 14 here. Knowing that he who raised Lord Jesus, who's that? That's the Heavenly Father. So the first verse we looked at was about the Holy Spirit. Now we're going to look about the Son. The power of the resurrection will raise us also with Jesus. It'll bring us with you into his presence. It's so interesting here, the, the chronology. Paul, all he's doing is he's saying the first resurrection of Jesus and the final resurrection together, it's almost like they're happening simultaneously. They're all one resurrection. If Jesus is raised, 
He's raised for all time. And everybody in Jesus is raised for all time. And that means that's happened for you. You have been given new life. Your afflictions do not determine who you are, okay? They are temporary. God will one day have us in his presence, last word, where there will be no more pain and no more affliction. Revelation 21, 3 to 5, okay? He's remaking us. He's giving you the power and the revelation and the faith in his son for what he's done to know the central story so that you can, cal- central story of human life, so you can calibrate your heart through afflictions that you might be facing and trials you might be facing. Uh, l- let me repeat that. The same power that God the Father used to raise Jesus from the dead is giving you a, is putting you in the family, in a new kingdom, in Christ Jesus, so that So that resurrection power, that can be the life so that as you come through something where you say, I'm giving up. I've had so many trials and so many tests, I really want to quit on the faith. Jessica, you were sharing a bit of that heart. We could hear that uh, this morning. So what does it mean to give thanksgiving even for the fire and for the trials and for the pains? Do we do that at that level? And the Apostle Paul says, yes, Because your ultimate destiny is being raised up with Christ and he's giving you that power to get there and to get through it. Don't let your afflictions lie to you and tell you it's all over, you don't count, and your life is meaningless. God loves you. He treasures you. He wants you to flourish. He wants you to represent him and share his truth And evangelize others. Tell them the good news. And live it out. That's what we're knowing. That's the message he's speaking. And that's what he's suffering for. People are persecuting him for that message in verse 14. But he says, that's coming. There's future grace. And now he's going to bring it back home. He's going to land it. It's kind of like a a, a chain and a ladder, if we can say it this way. And, And let me reveal that to you, the rest of the parts here in verse 15. For it is all for your sake. What is it? What do you think it means? All of it is for your sake. It is his preaching of the gospel, his writing the letters to them, his, he mentioned his sufferings in the earlier verses. Uh, he mentioned so that light can come earlier in the verses of chapter 4, so that light can come and be shown in darkness. It's so that people who are born in darkness and lost, he also wrote to the Romans uh, at another time uh, that they, they, that Gentiles, us, humanity, when we're born, we refuse to recognize the Father and to give thanks to him as Heavenly Father. We refuse to recognize him as above us, as our generator, if you will, our progenitor. And therefore, humanity turns to it, the creation and forms idols out of the creation. We are idolaters, but we live in darkness, convincing ourselves of a lie. And what happened when Jesus comes in our life and the spirit of faith and trust and truth comes in our life, we are freed from a lie like that. And it all started with him. And that's grace. It's all for your sake. Everything that we're doing, all the suffering, all the speaking, all of it is for your benefit because the gospel movement has started in Corinth and it started in you because you're sitting here if you're in Christ Jesus. And then what happens is, now watch, grace comes and it extends itself to more and more people. Grace, Paul says, is favor of God from heaven coming down on us. Grace is heavenly favor. So this is descending grace. What is that grace? This message that I can be forgiven, washed clean, liberated, not destroying my life or the life of others, but living my life to the glory of God. 
The same thing that Paul's doing the same, is filling up the image of Jesus Christ. The same thing for you. Grace, God's favor, that here is my son so all of your life can be, can be born again to live for God's glory. It's coming down from above. What does that produce when we see it? When we see how much grace is accomplished, what does it produce? There it is. More and more people turning to the Father, receiving the gospel, becoming saved, following Christ, and then giving thanks to God for changing and transforming their entire life. There's thanksgiving. You can't get to thanksgiving until you first have the work of the Holy Spirit who's rescuing you out of a big, big mess in your life. So count it as joy. If you're facing troubles and trials and difficulties and struggles and tears and pain or even sickness, friends, today the Lord just laid on my heart to encourage the church body because it's, it's not for nothing. God is using it so that you might come to know him totally, depend on him fully, so that out of your mouth you can share how good your God is and what he does for you even when you're hurting, even when you're struggling. And when that takes place, that you can recognize, God, you're writing my story. And stop, and that in your life before, you were trying to control your story and write your own and complaining and fighting and all these things. Paul wrote to Titus that we would hate others and be hated by others, that there was all of this world of unrighteousness in us, and instead... Instead, Paul says, the movement of the gospel liberates one after another, after another, after another, and you have a whole new family of God who is giving thanksgiving back to God. Watch, Paul is using a play on words. The word for grace in this verse is the word charis. The word for thanksgiving is the word eucharista, or eucharist. Charis comes from above. It's divine. Thanksgiving, where does it come from? What's its direction? It's up. It's from us to God. Why do we not have people think that are full of thanksgiving? Why do we not hear a lot of gratitude or thanksgiving? Because we're not seeing how much grace has come down to us. Hey, you see? And when our hearts fill up with the joy of that grace and the splendor of God's favor, God, thank you for rescuing this mess of a life and putting me back together. Then when we are saved, and that increases, the whole church increases, and then grace is returned back to God in every single way, through service, through praise, songs, spiritual songs, washing feet, Loving each other, forgiving each other, confessing to each other, walking with each other, unifying with each other, reconciling with each other. Thanksgiving takes place. That is the stuff of Thanksgiving. The stuffing of Thanksgiving. Just to make sure you're awake. That's what's on the inside. That's what has to go back. And God loves it. Because all of those things do the last line. They bring glory to God. There's the Father. Spirit in the first verse, son raised and enacting the story to be the grace of God coming down to us. And then God the Father receives what is, he is worthy of receiving, and that is your life. Your heart, your words, your praise, your emotion, your affection, your love, your life poured out to him. You have a responsibility to honor him. And to give him thanks because of his gift. But you also have a privilege and a joy to do it. It's a delight. But you can't get there unless you follow the chain. Grace through the Holy Spirit comes in our hearts who then guides us to navigate through all the afflictions that we have that God is not allowing to destroy us, 
but is allowing to reform us, to make us stand firm in him and in the gospel story with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead to bring us to a place where we recognize, God, you're in control. I surrender. Here's thanksgiving. Surrender, surrender, surrender. You're, you have charge of stories. God, thank you for placing me in this marriage. Thank you for placing me in this, in this country. Thank you for placing me in this career. Thank you for placing me in this body with these people. God, this is hard, but thank you for this. And thank you for, thank you for these children, even though they've just basically destroyed all of my life savings uh, in my house. God, thank you. There's still, you're in control. I don't know necessarily how it goes tomorrow, but I do know how this story ends. And for that, and I know how it began. And for that, I give you praise and thanks. Thanksgiving. Now we are giving meaning to the central story of life. Now we're giving meaning to that. I'm going to give you an illustration, then we're going to application points and close. A few years ago, now maybe about 10 now, I was invited, our family was invited to a Thanksgiving meal and dinner uh, with an, uh, an Italian friend of Sandy's, and uh, she was married to an American uh, guy uh, here who was stationed on the base. And so they had, a, they had a long tour, and I think he did a GS job too. I'm, I'm not sure uh, their things, but they were here for a long time because she's from this area. And so they had prepared a really, really nice Thanksgiving meal with a lot of, uh, they were kind of foodies, so they had put a lot of dishes together and stuff, and, and we were there. I was, I was excited when they start brought, bringing out all the different, and the presentation was beautiful, everything was decorated. And so we had known them, we were visiting and having a good time, and, and then we sat down for the meal, and the moment that the meal came, um, she, uh, being generally religious Italian, uh, she looks over at her husband, and she says, hey, uh, kind of being that we have a pastor here sitting at our table, should we maybe just say a little prayer, a little thanksgiving, uh, or say something maybe that we're thankful for before we start the meal? And, he, and so I looked over at him, and I was expecting, yeah, we're going to pray. And I was excited because I wanted to give thanks. There's a lot to give thanks for. And uh, he paused, and he kind of looked down, and then he looked back up, and he goes, no, the food's going to get cold. And I've been waiting, and I'm hungry. Let's get going. And then he grabbed the first plate and started dishing it out. And I was like, dude, <laughs> bro, you don't know. You think you put all this here at this table? You, you think you're breathing right now because of you? You know, I was really, really shocked. And I was just kind of thinking through this. Uh, quietly inside, I just gave a, a prayer of thanks as, I, as, as we went into that wonderful, beautiful meal. And it was supposed to represent all of God's goodness and bounty toward us. And I got to thinking, I'm like, why would he refuse that? And it was so painful and it was so awkward. And I realized this. He had nothing to give thanks for because his life wasn't pointed to the glory of God. It was pointed to the glory of himself. And so that's why you can say, my food's going to get cold. Let me tell you, the food was hot, but the heart was cold. And that's where Thanksgiving it makes all the difference. And, I'm, and I was just thinking through, I'm like, of course, there's nothing. He doesn't yet see. The spirit of faith is not bringing him through all the hard work he's doing to excel at his career to be able to point others to Jesus' essential story because he doesn't want it. And therefore, nothing in his life is really worth giving thanks to God because I've already done it. So let's eat because I'm hungry, kind of a thing. And uh, so in that shocking thing, I started to understand. We, we as Christians, if you're called to be a Christian, God saved you and gave you everything. Being a Christian is a recognition that everything, even the purpose for my life is in Christ. So everything I do is to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or you drink, do all to the glory of God. Have we memorize that verse? You can see a lot of parents starting to look at their kids in that, right? In that way. Three applications. First application, what is Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is declaring the meaning of Christ into suffering and into life when it doesn't feel like it has any meaning at all. When you're like, why am I going through this? Why am I still in this marriage? Why am I still in this place? Why am I still in this job? Why am I still in this church? You're declaring meaning, God, thank you. 
You're having a purpose. You're doing some, you're writing the story. Thank you for all that it took to get me here. I know you won't destroy me. Number two, Thanksgiving is the upward response to the downward grace in us. Okay? Again, if you don't have the spirit of faith coming into your life, showing you and revealing to you who the Lord Jesus is, working through these afflictions for you, then you can't get to thanksgiving come out because you can't see the grace of God. But if you have, then the grace is pouring down on you from above. And what is thanksgiving? It's pouring it back in kind to him. Okay? So this week, can I give you this? Just start, have an attitude of gratitude, right? Like our moms always said. And get that back to God because he deserves it. He's given us so much. Three, this Thanksgiving is the privilege of making your whole life, everything, be about the meaning of being, um, giving beauty and weight and glory to God. Meaning that he's important. He's central. The intentionality of God's presence in your life that you see him, you acknowledge him, and you follow him. That's bringing glory to God. Thanksgiving is part of that, and it builds up all the way through. And when you see the grace, you return the thanks. And when you return the thanks, you are giving glory to God and aligning your life. He's waiting for it. Make sure you give it to him if you're saved in the gospel.